well, some great, great reads in the bookstore at this time. So, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, title of our study this morning, Treasure in Earthen Vessels. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul contrasted the old covenant of law with the new covenant of grace. The old covenant that he said, well, the letter kills. But he talked about how in Christ we have life. God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, life eternal, all God's gift to us. So when we read in chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, well, it's pointing us back. It's saying in light of the fact, that we've been saved by grace, not by law, not by our efforts, not by our performance, not by our good intentions. God reached out and saved us. Therefore, since we have this ministry, the same ministry that brought us to faith in Christ, the ministry of redemption and reconciliation, the ministry of the good news of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The first key word in this chapter is the word we. And Paul is pointing out the fact that this isn't just what he was about or what he was doing. This is what he and the others committed to the cause of Christ were involved in. We have this ministry, a common experience, a common response, a common message. And as we'll see in verse 7 when we get to it, well, we have this treasure in earthen vessels or in jars of clay. We have this ministry of reconciliation. Like John the Baptist, we preach repent, confess your sin, turn from it, trust in Jesus, and you'll find forgiveness and life eternal, his gift to you. He says, we have this ministry, then we have received mercy. There's a biblical principle here, and, and I've often had people ask, and I'm sure you've had people ask you, well, I, why the cross? Why did Jesus have to suffer and die, and how can it be that someone who suffered and died on a cross nearly 2,000 years ago can provide atonement for my sin. How does that all work? And it's actually simpler than you might think. Here's the answer if you're wondering. Here's the answer if other people ask you. The principle is this. The one who forgives must pay. Now, I've often illustrated it in this way. I, I used to say, say I loaned you $500. Since that's so unlikely and we all know it, say you loaned me $500. And I came and I said, listen, there's no way I can repay this debt. I know it doesn't seem like much to you, but it, it's more than I can ever save or come up with. And so you're like, listen, I've prayed about it. I'm, I'm going to just forgive you that debt. Now, Here's the principle, and then we're going to apply it. It cost me nothing to ask your forgiveness. It cost you $500 to forgive my debt. And this is the principle. The one who forgives has to pay. Jesus didn't just pray from the cross, Father, forgive them. He made that forgiveness possible by paying for our sin. Why the cross? The wages of sin is death. In the cross of Christ, we see how bad our sin really is. And when we're like, well, okay, so you died for my sin? That's what the scripture says. That's what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. He paid a debt he didn't owe because we had a debt we couldn't pay. That's the principle. And, and so when he says we've received mercy, we want to think in, in light of his forgiveness. Mercy, by the way, not 
getting what you deserve. We often contrast that with grace, which is actually getting what you don't deserve. We didn't deserve all God's given to us. It is his gift to us. And we didn't get what we had coming because Jesus took that upon himself. Well, since we have this ministry, since we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Whatever we're going through in the natural, in the day-to-day, well, we have God within. We use the word of people who are enthusiastic. Well, we call them just that. It's a commonly used word. But it actually comes from two Greek words, the word in, which needs no explanation, and the word theos, which is a name in the Greek for God. So the idea is God within. How do I overcome in trial and temptation and tribulation? How do I fight through persecution and discouragement and and despair? I have God within. I'm not just toughing it out. He is getting me through. And that's true for every born again believer. Well, we've touched base on the, or touched base on the fact that Paul had accusers. Some of them were following him from city to city saying, you can't trust Paul, he's not one of the main guys. And and this whole saved by grace, that's great, but you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the law of Moses. We've touched on it. We've dealt with it. It will come up again and again. But Paul had another group of accusers, and that, that group was made up of people who weren't about the law, who weren't from Jerusalem, They just didn't like that Paul was saying, hey, no idolater or fornicator or homosexual or drunkard or, you know, he gives the list and he says, people who have this lifestyle will never inherit the kingdom of God. So he has people that are saying, you can't trust him. And there are three accusations made concerning him that actually turn out to be true of those who were accusing him. I don't know if you've noticed it. More often than not, when somebody's all, you're this and you're this and you're this, I start to look at them and wonder, I wonder if you're that. Because I can't see why you would see that in me. Now, I may be some things and have done some things. But, but here's what they were accusing Paul of. First of all, shameful attitudes, a crooked and crafty walk, misusing God's word. And he's saying, we've renounced the hidden things of shame. We're not walking in craftiness. We're not handling the word of God deceitfully. We are manifesting the truth and commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The attitudes they accused Paul of that they were actually displaying, arrogant, prideful, I know better than you, And here's what it was all masking, a hidden agenda. They were accusing Paul of having a hidden agenda, but they were the ones with the hidden agenda. Paul's trying to bring people to Jesus. They're trying to bring people under the law or say it's okay to live in your sin. Neither can be true. The crooked, crafty walk, it's used of those who tested Jesus and they... You know, each group that was opposed to Jesus, they took turns and trying to ensnare or trap him. At one point, they come saying, one small group of detractors, they come saying, hey, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? They figure they could trap him, pitting him either against Rome, which would be real problems, or against his own people who weren't really loving that their tax dollars were going to Caesar and being squandered on things that... Well, we're actually shameful and horrible. And in any case, Jesus deals with that trap by saying, show me a coin whose inscription is it, whose, you know, imprint is it, whose uh, image is it. And they say Caesar, so render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God. I bring it to your attention because their motivation was not to find out, is it lawful to pay taxes, but try to get Jesus in a place where they could accuse him. When Satan tempted Eve, you really get the same thing. The word is used of Satan, this word crafty. And we'll come back to that because we'll talk 
briefly about that temptation in, in the context of a couple verses down. Well, the third thing they accused Paul of was misusing God's word, corrupting it or distorting it like people are today. When they say, well, the golden rule or the, you know, the great commandment would justify, and then they'll name some horrible sin that, that God tells us through Paul, if you continue in that sin, you'll never inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus would never justify something that would keep you from the kingdom of God. He died so you could be a part of it. So it doesn't matter who says it or how high up they are, how low down they are. It's like, wow, really? Jesus is, is okay with that sin? When the Bible, to me, I've been reading it, well, only for, oh, 33, 34 years. I mean, regularly, daily, continuously. And I've noticed something as I've read through and read through and read through. Every time I read it, it says the same thing. And, and, and we'll talk about how people today are saying, yeah, but that's not what it means. No, it says what it means, and it means what it says. It's just not that complicated. Well, we saw in chapter 3 that the gospel, the good news, was veiled to the Jews. Now, not all of them, because Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. James, John, the first disciples. The 3,000 that gave their life to the Lord on the day of Pentecost, they were mostly from Jewish background. So lots of Jews came to the Lord, but the majority weren't, wouldn't, and hadn't. And, and so Paul said the gospels veiled to them. So when they read Moses, instead of seeing past Moses, instead of seeing the law was meant to, to bring us conviction so we'd cry out for mercy, that the feast and festivals were meant to point to Jesus, that the priesthood was to point to Jesus. We looked at all of this in some depth last time. They'd read it, but they couldn't see past it. Now, he moves now to the Gentiles, and, and he said, basically, here's what was going wrong with the Jews. They'd hear the gospel, but they just didn't see how all of these things were really pointing to Jesus. The Gentiles... Well, they didn't have the law. They didn't have the priesthood. They didn't have a temple or feast or festivals, at least not God's temple. No, what they had is God's small g, like the gods are us of today. It's like God as you know him, God as you define him, God as you would think he might be. So they were actually making God in their image instead of realizing, no, you were made in God's image and that image is marred by sin. So what happens is the Gentiles think, well, there are gods of the sky and gods, small g again, plural, because they're not atheistic, they're polytheistic. They believe in gods, plural, many gods, not the true and living God. So gods of the sea and gods of the sky and gods of the land, and, and, and they think that their gods can be pleased or appeased by their good works. The idea that if I do good, I can overcome whatever bad. There are so many problems with that, but what it ended up doing was veiling the gospel to them. And who is the gospel veiled to? He says in verse 3 here, even if our gospel it is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That word perishing means lost, whose minds... The God of this age, note, small g, has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He's saying, here's what's happening. They're walking in darkness. They're blinded by the enemy so they don't see the light. And you have the blind leading the blind. You have the philosophers of the day. And you have the religions of the day, but none of them were bringing people to God. None of them were pointing people to Christ. And so, well, the God of this age. If you've ever wondered, why does God, the true and living God, even allow Satan to be called a God? Well, because God knows he's God. He created Satan. Satan, like each of us, was made by God and for God, but he rebelled against God. And so what happens is he's called a God because of what he wants. 
and how people deal with them. You know, in our generation, because we're scientific and educated, Satan's best trick is convincing people he doesn't even exist. And that evil isn't really as bad as it seems, that it's more if people could be culturally changed or if society were a little better because people have good hearts, but they just do bad things. God says our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And he says Satan is real. And that Satan, well, we're not, we're not unaware of his devices. We know how he works. So Satan's plan, his desire was to be worshipped. He said, I'm going to be exalted above the mountain of the Most High. I'm going to be worshipped. But here's the deal. People who aren't worshipping the true and living God, who would never think, well, I'm a Satan worshipper. It, it, it's you're either worshiping God or you're worshiping something or someone else. Now, Satan is a master in spiritual deception. In fact, he is so good at deceiving, he has deceived himself. He actually thinks he's worthy of the worship rendered to him. How do we know that? He actually asked Jesus to bow down and worship him. That would be, well, we can't even get a comparison that'll make sense to us. But let me just say, it would be like having your four-year-old, if you've had one or have one, say, you really should just thank me for everything you have. And you'd be like, I should thank you. I provide everything for you. You would die if I didn't take care of you. Of course, we take care of our kids because we love them. But Satan was made for God and by God. And he rebels and then he's like, Bow down and worship me. We'll come back to that. Now listen, Satan, we're told we're not ignorant of his devices. He's called a tempter. We know he tempts us. But if there's nothing in you that could yield or wants that thing he's tempting you to, you're going to be fine. So the issue isn't, oh, where is he? Or what's going on with him? It's what's happening within me. Where's my flesh? Because, well, here's an example you're walking down the street and you see a, a, you know, beat up old jalopy and the car's running and you don't have transportation, but you know, you're looking at the car and you hear the way it's running. Even if you were a thief, you probably think, I got more chance of getting to the destination on foot than in that thing. But switch it and now it's a Ferrari and it's running and you're like, well, maybe just a little test drive. Here's the bottom line. Most of us would never steal a car. Why? Well, it would be stupid. We know there's a penalty for it. And as Christians, we're not to steal anyway. But the point is, I can't be tempted to do something I have no desire or inkling to do anyway. So Satan studies people. And his little minions that serve him, he transforms himself into an angel of light. They come as angels of light. They study human nature. And they're like, wow, this guy could be tempted this way. How would they know? Because they can see what we do. They listen to what we say. They watch what we watch. And so the point is this. Satan is a tempter. And then he's an accuser. He tempts us. And then if we fall into it, he accuses us of doing it. Well, of course we did it. But the, the point is, he's called a liar. He's called the father of lies. And his M.O. is this. He questions the word of God. He denies the word of God. And then he just lies about the character and nature of God. We saw it with Eve. Did God say you're not to eat of the fruit in the garden? It all begins with a question. And today people are saying, well, does the Bible really say or is that an accurate translation? Listen, most of what God wants us to know is so clear it doesn't require a translation. In other words, it's, it's not true that there's so much confusion in reading the Bible. What was it? Um, I think it was um, Samuel Clemens. You, you know him by another name, but I'm remembering that one. And, and uh, Mark Twain. Anyway, he said, it's not the things in the Bible I don't understand that bother me, but the things I do. And I think that's really how it is for most of us. We understand it. 
And that's really the problem, you see, because if we understand it and we don't deal with it, well, God calls that sin. So God tells Eve, you're going to die if you eat. And, and, and Satan says, you're not going to die. You won't die. So he questions the word of God and then he denies the word of God. I want you to know this is exactly what's happening today. And, and, and whether it's, it's, you know, well, it, it's all through the culture. While God's the same and his word's the same, the culture's kind of shifting. And today, politicians, and I don't know what was going on 30 years ago, I don't think they had the capacity or the uh, availability to poll people the way they do today, where you can poll a million people and you can say, this is the, the mood of the country. Let's go that way. And then the mood shifts and we're like, let's go that way. That's not a leader. That's not what we're electing. We're electing someone to look at the principles and make wise decisions on our behalf. So anyway, he questions the word of God. He denies the word of God. And then he impugns God's character. He knows in the day you eat, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It's like God doesn't want you to be like him. Listen, God wanted Adam and Eve to be like him. He made them. They were created in his image. They were already like him as much as they could ever be as his creation. In the fall, did it make them more like God? They became not just less than they were, but alienated from God because they died spiritually in that day and the process of death physically began that day as well. So he says, those who were veiled, they're perishing and they're blinded. And listen, when he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, you're, you're the son of God, right? Turn these stones to bread. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I think I told you last week, a couple of weeks ago, I came in and there was like junior hires, three rows spread out in the front. And I'm like, oh my gosh, so I'm 42, so I'm 43, so I'm 44. I don't know how this is going to work. And, and anyway, it did end up working, but it cost me pizza and other things. And, but I, I thought of this very thing. See, with you, I can just tell you Deuteronomy, and you're like, maybe Deuteronomy would be good to read. And if you knew all three quotes from the mouth of Jesus in regards to his temptation came from Deuteronomy, then you're like, I really need to read that book. But with the junior hires, i got to say, who knows what book? And, and then there's no hands, and I'm like, free piece of pizza to the one who knows. And all of a sudden, at least they're guessing. But in the end, I wanted one of them to say, you know, it's really funny. The guy that got it right, his name's Xander, his buddy leans over to him and he's like, he guessed, he guessed, like, that's cheating. And I'm like, he got it right. So anyway, here's the point. Jesus didn't have to quote scripture. He could have just made something up. That would have been okay. He is God, you know. But he quoted, I think, to show us, here's how you deal with the enemies temptations with his lies with his accusations the truth will set you free and when satan comes to jesus and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant he says all this is mine and it's a rough paraphrase but it helps get the sense i can get it for you wholesale that's really what's going on here because Jesus knew the cost of having you in the kingdom of god would be his death on the cross he knew that and saying, Satan's saying, you don't have to do that. It's mine, and I'll give it to you. They're mine. I'll give them to you. Here's what Jesus understood. Satan's a liar. It's not his. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Was, is, will always be. It's the Lord's, made for him and by him. And even as Jesus walked on this earth, we see Satan saying, worship me. And Jesus is like, that's not going to happen. It is written. And I love that that word is appears in all three responses. Because it's saying, he could have said it was written since it was written so long ago. Why did he say is? Because it's written, but it's still in full force. In other words, written then, but standing now, applicable today. So God's word always true in every generation men's ideas and concepts and morality or lack thereof 
is always changing. Now, I'm sure if you've shared the Lord that you've heard unbelievers say something that, hey, maybe they think it up, maybe the enemy puts it in their minds. Either way, have you ever heard anybody said, and you don't have to raise your hand, or maybe you've even said it, maybe you're still in that, that category of an unbeliever. You're checking it out, you're looking at it, you're trying to figure out if it's all true. But if you've ever said or heard anybody say, you can't trust the Bible? Well, I'm like, what can I trust then? You know, I I like to answer questions with questions because I notice Jesus does that. And so it's like, well, uh, I don't know, but you can't trust the Bible. Then, well, why can't you trust the Bible? It's just written by men. First of all, can't trust the Bible. Absolutely false. God's word never changes. It's always saying the same thing. We can and must trust it especially in a culture where things change so quickly. But here's the deal. They'll say, just written by men. If you take the word just out, you have something that's true, but in the context they're using it, it's false. Listen, men did write the Bible, but the Scripture says the prophets of old were moved on by the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God's talking to men who were writing things down. You think Moses could have come up with the blueprints for the tabernacle and later the temple? You think he would have thought up the Ten Commandments and then the hundreds of civil laws that follow them and are spelled out in Scripture? Never would have happened. Moses didn't give us that. God gave us that. It's only called the law of Moses because it was delivered to and through Moses. So, So when they say you can't trust the Scripture, false. When they say just written by men, false. Have you ever had anybody say, the Bible's full of lies? I'm like, man. And, and here, here, you can really have fun with people to say, you know what? I think you're right. And, and then they'll be like, what? But you, no, no, you, you don't believe the Bible's full of lies. I say, no, there's lies in the Bible. I just mentioned one. Satan said, you won't die. Satan said, you'll be like God. See, you just have to know who's talking. There are lies recorded in the Bible, but here's what we can be sure of. Everything God says is true. So if God says you're going to die and Satan says you're not going to die, somebody's lying, and it's never God. So, So he's saying, listen, not everybody gets it. Not everybody hears it. Why? They're perishing. They're on the road that leads to destruction. It's the blind leading the blind. And they're like, follow me. And they're just walking off the edge of the cliff into an everlasting abyss. So blinded by the God of this age. Listen, to an unbeliever, the enemy of our soul says, you'll be fine. You're a good person. Would a loving God punish a wonderful person like you? First of all, in your heart of hearts, you know you're not that wonderful. My, my little niece, Kizzy, used to always say, I love you, Uncle Sam. And I'd be like, what's not to love? And, 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 and so, but it's just the game I played with her. I knew there's a, not, a lot not to love. And that's true about all of us. You know that saying, to know him is to love him? It's really only true of Jesus. Because as we get to know each other, we see, well... I I still like them, but I don't, not exactly what I thought I was seeing. That's true of all of us, but not Jesus. And we're going to see why as we press on into this, and we better do it or we won't see why. Well, to the unbeliever, he says, you're fine. You know what he says to the believer? How could you think that now that you've been forgiven? How could you say that? How could you do that? See, it's always condemnation and accusation, intimidation, And the enemy of our souls always wants us to be introspective, looking at ourselves, looking at our failures. He points us to the law, and then he says, you're condemned. But when God speaks to us by his Holy Spirit, he takes us to the cross. There's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul says in verse 5, we don't preach ourselves. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants for Jesus' sake. I think this was another common accusation. Paul's just trying to feather his nest. He's just trying to build his little kingdom. 
But he's saying, if that were true, wouldn't I be preaching Paul? I'm preaching Jesus. And we're just serving you by choice. Now he says, Christ Jesus the Lord. Usually we'll just pass by that stuff, but note, Christ is his mission. He came to suffer and die. Jesus is proper name, but in that name, he will save his people from their sins. That's the meaning. And then Lord, that's relationship. He's both Savior and Lord. And so he saves us from our sin, but then we become his servants. Well, it is the God we read, capital G, the true and living God, the one and only God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Verse 6, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When did light first shine out of darkness? When God, after creating something from nothing, said, let there be light, and the light appeared. Listen, we have the ability to build up or tear down with our words. We have the ability to encourage or discourage with our words, but we do not have the creative power that God has where we can say, let there be when there isn't and there will be. Only God can do such a thing. So it's first in creation, but this is actually talking about regeneration. It may be referring back initially, but it's the, the light that's shown in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And Jesus, of course, I am the light of the world. He who follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, you should know Jesus, after proclaiming that reality, tells the same disciples, you are the light of the world. Why? He was going to die for our sins, be buried, rise again, but then ascend, returning to the Father. He's there at the right hand of the Father, at the throne of God today, praying for us, making intercession for us and for the world that's yet to receive him. And so Jesus... When he walked this earth, well, his glory was masked in his humanity. That's why not everyone who was looking for the Messiah recognized him. John tells us, we beheld his glory. They were there on the mountain. Peter was there. John was there. James was there. And they saw past his humanity. They saw the glory of God as he was transformed in their presence there on the holy mount and so here's what happens jesus glory mask in his humanity now before i came to christ my humanity was actually masking my depravity because i could put on a smiley face and i could say yes ma'am and yes sir and and i could be so what people wanted or expected or needed me to be but i was fully depraved inside and so we can be grateful that what people see isn't what was it in within. But having come to Christ, verse 7 says, we have this treasure, the, the, the reality of the, the redemption, the reconciliation we have in Christ Jesus. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Literally, it would translate jars of clay, no doubt, where the band jars of clay got their name that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have mercy. We've received forgiveness. We've been reconciled to the Father. And he says, but this treasure is hidden from the world in these earthen vessels, in these jars of clay. Now listen, there is a graphic illustration in the Old Testament and uh, try to look at these. This is doctrinal. You get it fleshed out in the stories of Scripture. And so when you're reading the stories, you're looking for the doctrine that it could be pointing you to. When you're reading the doctrine, you're looking for the stories that will best illustrate it. And there's a story, a battle. We touched on one last week as we talked about the, the battle of Jericho. And they marched around and they were silent except for the priests blowing the trumpets. The trumpets it's to gather the people for war or worship. In their case, it was both. 
Well, we have this story when Gideon is ruling as a judge and the Midianites had just filled the valley around them. I mean, they were, they were looking at an innumerable multitude of people and there were 32,000 of them. And God says to Gideon, you know what, if I, I know these people... And if I let them go out there and, and take these guys on and I bring a victory, because the battle belongs to the Lord, they're going to boast that they did it. So he said, this army's too big for this job. And, and so he says, I want you to go out and tell everybody who's scared to go home. And Gideon says, well, I guess, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we're outnumbered, but what good would the chickens be anyway? So he goes on and says, if you're scared, go home. 22,000 people say, okay, we're gone. And, and now... He, he's got, you know, 10,000 people to take on this innumerable multitude. And God looks and he says, still too many. And, and you got to put yourself in Gideon's shoes to think, what would it be like to be preparing for battle? And, and then God to say, nope, still too many. And, 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 and so what he does is he says, I got another test for you. I want you to bring these guys down to the water. And uh, whoever gets on their hands and knees and laps like a dog... Or, or others are going to just take the water and cup it in their hand and keep their eyes up and, and drink. He says, I'm going to separate those I'll use from those I won't. And Gideon, if he's anything like me, he's thinking, okay, 50-50 chance. Probably get at least 5,000 of these guys out of this. But no, only 300 did it the way God intended. Or 300 did it and, and, and God says, oh, that's perfect. Let's see. Okay, those guys, they're gone too. Now he's got 300 men. What's the battle plan? Very much like the plan for Jericho. God says, well, listen, here's what you do. Gideon separates the army into three camps. And they're on three different ridges overlooking this great multitude. It's nighttime. They have a torch, not yet lit, but they're going to light it. They've got a trumpet. And they're going to blow those. And then they're going to light these torches. And they're going to break the uh, the jars of clay, the earthen vessels, so the light would shine forth. Now, you can't miss this picture. They go, it's, it's the, the dark of night. The, the shift is just changing where one group of guards has moved off and the other group has come on. So everybody's kind of just looking around and, and all of a sudden, the sword of the Lord and Gideon, the trumpets are blowing and the, sh the pitchers are shattered and the, the torches are lifted. And listen, how does that apply to us? Well, we're jars of clay. We're, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So when I'm shattered, when you're broken, the light of Jesus shines forth. If you've ever wondered, and I'm sure you have, if God loves me, why does he let so many things happen to me? How come he doesn't just protect me? And things that we would say, Lord, please don't let that happen. Then it happens. But in our brokenness, when we're shattered, Jesus' glory is manifested. Why? Well, at work, if everything's going great, people are getting laid off, but we've still got our job. In fact, they've given us a raise and a promotion and a bigger office. And, people, and we're like, praise the Lord, you know. And people are like, yeah, praise the Lord. You got everything. And we're like just suffering. But what happens when you get laid off? Now you're broken. Now you're busted. Now you're shattered. And you're like, how do you deal with that? Well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. People see the Lord better in our brokenness than in our success. And it's a paradox because we think, well, if I could succeed, then I could tell everybody, you know, that's sort of the thing today, right? Everybody wants to be famous. I don't want to be famous. I just want to go to a restaurant and sit down with my wife and have people not say, hey, aren't you Pastor Sam? Not, not that I'm, you know, completely against that, but that happens to us even in Oregon and in other places we go. Listen, I'm not saying I am famous. I certainly wouldn't want to be famous. But what I am saying is, like people who think, if I could be famous, then I would tell everybody about Jesus. I want to tell you something. If you're not telling people about Jesus now, you won't tell them about Jesus when you're famous. And, and those people say, well, if I could just, 
If I had a million dollars, I'd give, I'd give the Lord 10%. Let me suggest if you're not tithing now, you wouldn't tithe then. If you can't tithe off of a thousand, you won't tithe off of a million. Because it would be like hundred thousand. No way. But, but the whole point is, if we think we'd be different if we were more or greater or richer, no, we'd still be us. Everything negative about us would be magnified. So the point is today people are like, well, God, make me famous and I'll tell the world. If God wants a famous person to tell the world, you know what he does? He lets them play for the New York Knicks. And he's like, he's, he's already got Christians. He just gets a guy who's sleeping on his brother's couch and says, yeah, I'll put you right up there and everyone will know who you are. Or he puts them on a football team that, that's just magnificent. And, and, and it's like, that guy, he'll never be anything. Oh, my gosh, he's something. Whoa, look at what he's doing. And he's just like giving God the glory. See, he doesn't need to make us anything. We need to be going the other direction, not more of me, less of me, not a greater me, a broken me. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase. For that to happen, I must decrease. Well, Paul expresses what we've all experienced As he says, we're hard-pressed on every side. The word means hemmed in, afflicted, pressures increasing. But he says, we're not crushed. We're not crushed. He said, we're perplexed. That word means confused. Anybody ever feel confused? But he says, not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. I can feel, man, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. And then I remember, oh, yeah. He's with me. He's for me. He's in me. We have a living hope and he lives within us. And then he he says, and, and I like this, struck down but not destroyed. One of the older translations said knocked down but not knocked out. And I'm thinking, there's mixed martial arts in the Bible. Knocked down but not knocked out. Well, here's the deal. This is true for all of us, that that we do feel hemmed in, and there is pressure, and there is persecution, and it does lead to some confusion. Even John the Baptist, at one point, having been imprisoned, sends disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one, or should we be looking for another? Are you the one? You're the one who said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knows who Jesus is. He saw the heavens open and heard the voice of God and saw the dove descend upon Jesus at his baptism. John knew, but in his suffering, he started to question. We do that. That's when the enemy comes and starts to say, well, did he really say, or do you think, or is that really what it means? He goes on, verses 10 through 15, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. The idea is he identified with us on the cross, but we identify with him as well. We see ourselves, as Paul declares, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. And he said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake or for righteousness' sake that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is working in us, but life in you. Paul's saying all this is for your sake. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, verse 12, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. And here's the promise. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. He's saying we're going to be together in glory. Here's the promise. All things for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Now listen, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides or remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it brings forth much grain. He uses an illustration they would have all understood because they were an agricultural society. He's not talking about grain. He's talking about him. I've got to fall and die. And, and 
order to bring forth more and much greater fruit. But, but the same thing is true for us. I can't live for him unless I die to self. And we can't live for him unless we die to self. Therefore, verse 16, and here's our new perspective. He gives us three contrasts. We do not lose heart, even though, first contrast, our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The outward man, that's the physical one that everyone can see. Now, some of you are 20, and it doesn't feel like the outward man is perishing. But if you're over 50, well, you know the outward man is perishing. And you feel it. You wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, Lord, get me through the day and give me strength for, you know, the things that lie ahead. He's saying we are in a state of perishing, of decaying, of dying. That's what's happening to us physically. Feel it or not. But the inward man, the spiritual man, that man is being completed. God began a work. He's Promise to complete. We're growing stronger spiritually. We're being strengthened spiritually. Then he contrasts the temporal and the eternal. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction. He's saying the thing that we dread the most or fear the most. And then it actually happens. He's saying it's a temporal light affliction. Well, how can he say that? Because our greatest pain, our harshest reality, it fades in the light of eternity. And it's a done deal that when we stand before him in glory, we're not going to bring out our little list of like, how could you let us go through that? We'll be like, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It will just be about him. And so he's saying in the temporal, man, our, our afflictions, as difficult as they seem, they are light because in the eternal, it's a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I love how the apostle Paul multiplies adjectives. When he writes to the Ephesians, he could have said, you know, God can do anything. But he said he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. He just wants to make us see, give us a sense of how great our God is. And then the third and and final contrast between the things everyone sees and the things seen only through the eyes of faith. He says, we do not look, verse 18, at the things which are seen. Like the disciples walking with Jesus, they just celebrated the Passover. They're going out to the garden. He knows he's going to be arrested and crucified. They haven't put that together. And they're talking about how magnificent the stones are of the temple. And he says, hey, not one of these stones will remain upon another. It seems so solid, so powerful, so lasting. It came from God. Certainly God would preserve it. But that's the stuff that we can see. And what appears to be so solid is passing away. But he says the things which are temporary, but the things, well, he says we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, excuse me, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Listen, here's something we can't see. The inner person, God sees that we're born again. He knows who we are and what he's fashioning and forming us to be and do and accomplish for the kingdom and, and the witnesses he can make of us. And so the bottom line, and we saw it in our study of Romans, God is using everything that happens to us or comes into our life, every situation, every circumstance, All our sufferings, all our sorrows, he's using it for our good and his glory. He breaks us that the light of Christ might shine forth from us. So if you know him today, rejoice in him. Focus on the things that are eternal. We still got to deal with the day to day, but we have an eternal perspective. If you don't know him, today is the day of salvation. Confess your sin. 
that just like every one of us, you are a guilty sinner in the sight of a holy God. Turn from it and trust in Jesus. He died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. His promise, you will receive the gift of everlasting life. Lord, thank you for this amazing book, an amazing passage. And, and Lord, for those of us who studied 1 Corinthians, I'm sure many, as I first thought, Lord, thought, well, what more could Paul have to say to this group? And we're so grateful for this second letter as he takes us so much deeper and so much further. As the illustrations get clearer, we're so grateful, Lord, that your plan is a perfect plan. It's not us becoming better us's so that people can follow us. It's, it's us broken and humbled in your sight and before people so they see the glory of Jesus within. That he, Lord, is manifested in our weakness. His strength made perfect. And today, if... Your suffering, no, he's with you, he's for you, he's promised never to leave you or forsake you. And this present light affliction, it will pale in the light of eternal glory. Keep focused on that reality. And then for those of us who've yet to say, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin. Today is the day of salvation. And if you need to pray that prayer, would you raise your hand and hold it high? And I'll acknowledge you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray with you, and you will be forgiven every sin. That's his promise. You will receive his mercy, so you're not going to get what you've got coming, and you will receive grace, so you get what you could never earn or deserve. Life eternal, his gift. Anyone this hour, this service, this day. God bless you. I see your hand there on the side. Awesome. Anyone else? Want to join this brother and say, me too. I don't want to go one more moment without surrendering my life to the Lord Jesus. Anybody else before we pray? Maybe in the overflow, I can't see you, but God does. Maybe you're logged on or listening. God sees you. So you who raise your hand and anyone else who wants to pray along, pray aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for choosing me, for drawing me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to suffer and die for my sins. Thank you that he came not to condemn, but to save. Thank you for convicting me and now drawing me to the cross where I find forgiveness and everlasting life. Thank you for saving me. Turn from my sin. Trust in Jesus, your son, and in his name I pray, amen.